So, in the last uh, three lectures we have been looking at uh, the issue of uh, spintronic materials and what makes inorganic solids more attractive uh, mainly because in the presence and absence of magnetic field you see large changes in the resistance and uh, to give a classic example we have discussed about uh, manganite chemistry and how in a simple lattice you have ferromagnetic structures which can be fine tuned to alter the electronic properties. In other words, we see a large change in the resistance in the by the influence of magnetic field which brings about a huge drop in resistance which we call it as colossal magneto resistance. Also in metallic samples we have discussed how the interfaces can help in ordering ferromagnetic compounds in both ferromagnetic way and in antiferromagnetic way and thereby um, affecting the electronic properties. Um, another group of compounds have attracted interest and this is also under the broader uh, area of spin electronics, spintronics and this is called as dilute magnetic semiconductors. We all know that uh, semiconductor industry is mainly governed by silicon technology and uh, there are lot of additions to silicon technology which has come up in the last 2-3 decades. Therefore, in semiconductor industry can there be anything new that can come out other than the existing silicon based technology. The most pr prominently used material other than silicon is gallium arsenide but it is a very expensive technology because you cannot accommodate any amount of oxygen as a impurity. Therefore, this technology is a very very uh, touchy or very sensitive technology. So, mostly the semiconductor technology involves high vacuum and uh, in conditions which is uh, normally not exercised for other um, compounds that are used in uh, functional applications. So, if we can bring about a magnetic signature in a typical semiconductor, will that affect the semiconductor technology is the question. Today I am going to take you through some course of slides where I am going to show you specific examples where compounds which were origi originally thought to be semiconducting if it is transformed to a magnetic uh, semiconductor or if we can induce semiconducting property, what are the implications and how we can understand that. And also I will give some examples of slightly higher band gap materials other than the typical semiconductors and show how magnetic properties can be governed and studied in those. Now, uh, to quickly uh, take you through some of the basic definitions and then some examples which will form the case for today's lecture. Let me ask this question what are these dilute magnetic semiconductors? These, these semiconductors they make use of both charge and spin of electrons and thereby magnetic elements can be introduced to bring about a situation where a semiconductor which is non magnetic can become magnetic semiconductor. So, uh, precisely this cartoon will tell us what such a situation is. This is a typical non magnetic semiconductor where the uh, semiconductor uh, material is arranged in a um, in a periodic lattice and suppose I am going to add some transition metal ions into this semiconductor. Then one can see um, that this sort of magnetic impurities can be accommodated in the crystal lattice and they are in fact ordered and in such situation you end up with paramagnetic dilute magnetic semiconductors because these ions are magnetic, but they are oriented in different fashion. Now, what is important is the crystal lattice still remains the same we are not um, disturbing the lattice and classic example is that of a 2 6 semiconductor. Some of the known ones are gallium arsenide and uh, 
this is a typical magnetic uh, semiconductor which is a uh, gadolinium sulphide, but the most prevalent one is gallium arsenide. Now, if the same paramagnetic DMS compound we can try to induce some holes and if we can induce some holes here in this structure those holes will actually turn this paramagnetic signatures to a concerted ferromagnetic signal. Thereby we translate a paramagnetic uh, dilute magnetic semiconductor to a ferromagnetic dilute magnetic semiconductor. So, two issues are there take a semiconductor add transition metal ions and if you can engineer some holes if you can add some holes and those holes will stabilize the paramagnetic stuff to a ferromagnetic stuff. So, in essence you will see a concerted magnetic moment or a total magnetic moment which is prevalent even at room temperature. So, this is a example of a dilute magnetic semiconductor it was reported by Ono and co-workers in science magazine in 1998. <coughs> now, questions that remain to be answered here is if manganese is doped in gallium uh, arsenide in which the magnetic domain uh, dopant provides a magnetic moment then a spin polarized charge also comes into picture because the carrier is now having a spin memory and this can actually bring about a new phase of spintronic materials. So, a transition metal ion doped in a semiconductor matrix will induce a magnetic moment and thereby provide a spin polarized charge carrier which brings about a um, spin a spintronic material, but there are some primary questions that we need to address. What is this question? What are the states of uh, manganese? What is the oxidation state? Are the manganese states localized or they are strongly hybridized with the gallium ars arsenide valence band? It can stand aloof or it can actually hybridize with the gallium arsenide valence band and otherwise they can form a separate impurity band. If they form a separate impurity band then you cannot call this as a dilute magnetic semiconductor. It has to mingle itself with the valence band of the host material therefore, it is very important to understand where this manganese is going because you are trying to dope to the tune of 2 percent to 4 percent not more than that because it has to be dilute. Now, in such concentration where is your manganese and what is the nature of this manganese is the question. Now, to understand this sophisticated techniques such as X-ray absorption spectroscopy and XMCD that is X-ray magnetic circular dichroism. These are some of the refined uh, techniques that are used to see whether it is truly a magnetic signal or not or whether it is coming from a impurity induced magnetic signature. So, these two are um, uh, synchrotron based analysis which can give you precise idea about what is the nature of the interactions in this compound. Uh, this cartoon will tell us what exactly the uh, signature of ma manganese doped gallium arsenide is. In the top um, <coughs> figure we see the manganese L 2 3 edge of the absorption spectra this is from the x-ray absorption spectra. Now, you can actually make this compound which is uh, manganese doped gallium arsenide okay. and you can look at the manganese L 2 3 edge and you can do that in two ways one is magnetization uh, in the uh, you can actually try to probe this in two different directions one is parallel and anti parallel alignment of polarization and when the magnetization is aligned in 0 0 1 that is this curve and the magnetization when it is aligned in 1 1 1 direction that is in this curve green curve. 
So, if you clearly see that in two directions 0 0 1 and in 1 1 1 direction you see that there is a huge drop in the intensity. In other words the features x-ray absorption features are radically different when you try to take the XMCD uh, sorry uh, x-ray absorption spectra of the manganese uh, feature and in the plane of magnetization out of plane of magnetization. As a result what happens you can clearly see that it is magnetized the lattice is magnetic as a result there is change in the x-ray absorption structural feature. So, this is one signature that can tell us that it is truly magnetic. Suppose manganese is not doped then you would see uh, both the intensities in 0 0 1 and 1 1 0 they will be actually the same. So, this is one signature in the other one you can see XMCD um, X-ray magnetic circular dichroism for magnetization along 0 0 1 that is black here and the one in green is um, in the 1 1 1 plane. The pronounced differences between the absorption spectra and the observed anisotropy in the uh, features in the XMCD are most remarkable. You can clearly see in this region that the intensity of the uh, features in both 0 0 1 and 1 on 1 plane clearly shows that there is a remarkable change in the XMCD and uh, this work was actually reported by Edmonds and uh, co-workers which is also published in PRL uh, in the year 2006. Now, if you make the XMCD if you take the XMCD and try to make a plot against the angle of rotation then you can see the dependence of XMCD signal for the out of plane and in plane um, as a function of angle theta and you can clearly see that the open circles which represents the angular dependence in 1 1 0 plane and the solid uh, symbols indicate the results in 1 0 0 plane. So, in the 1 0 0 plane you do not uh, you see between here and here there is a angle of rotation which means there is a magnetic signature which is intrinsic of the manganese doped gallium arsenide and the same is true if you look at uh, look at the um, <coughs> XMCD features here the hall measurements clearly show that there is a change in the hall mobility or the hole density as we um, <coughs> as we take the signature from the XMCD uh, results. What does this mean? There is a angle dependent X-ray magnetic circular dichroism which clearly shows that when manganese is doped in gallium arsenide there is a definite magnetic signature coming. Now, so what do we understand about this dilute magnetic semiconductors? These are semiconductors that are doped with magnetic ions. The interaction among these spins lead to a magnetic state. The charge of the electron enables semiconductors to process information and the spin allows to realize magnetic information for storage devices. These type of these type of materials have a lattice structure similar to that of undoped semiconductor. Okay. So, one of the main thing that one would re require or one would look for is the single phase uh, x-ray single phase that has to be present. Not only x-ray single phase the it should be also magnetically a single phase material because you are dealing with the very small doping and in such situations you may not be able to trace the impurity ion in from the x-ray because it is very very low. Therefore, you need to know whether it is magnetically a single phase and structurally a single phase. There are several um, examples that can uh, suggest how tricky this uh, situation can become, but uh, before that what uh, one slide I would like to show 
what is the implication of this uh, dilute magnetic semiconductor. The possible application is it would create a revolutionary new class of electronic uh, based on the spin degree of freedom of the electron in addition to the charge. So, so far the semiconductor devices they are more concerned with the charge of the electron. Now, if you bring about a spin ferromagnetic spin into this then you can actually translate this into a single uh, integration on a single chip which will comprise of both the semiconducting property and the magnetic property and therefore, you can bring about a new uh, <coughs> possibilities in spintronics. Uh, this was uh, reported uh, by Zutik uh, in uh, review of modern physics in 2004 for a better understanding on all the possible applications of this. Now, um, another question that we can ask about the usefulness of this spin and charge in dilute magnetic semiconductors when will this finally be as easy as switching on the light. Is it a near possibility or a distant reality that one can hope for many people keep asking this question and uh, whether this can be ably applied to uh, our computer technology in these days and especially because this can affect the random access memory this has a direct implication. The answer that we can say as of now based on the results that we have that using this spin and charge in semiconductor industry is not too far. <coughs> so, um, why uh, there is such a great interest in these materials because in um, year 2000 detail and co-workers they reported uh, using theoretical predictions they ran through several of the semiconducting materials and they tried to predict if there is a possibility of looking for new materials. In such case you start first with silicon which is our reference point compared to silicon you have 2 4 semiconductors or 2 uh, uh, 3 5 semiconductors or 2 6 semiconductors. You can see aluminum phosphide, aluminum arsenide, gallium phosphide, gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, indium arsenide all these combinations are somewhere close to silicon. These are the theoretical predictions indicating that they can turn ferromagnetic. Now, notably if you see we are somewhere around this region of room temperature. If we have to realize a room temperature ferromagnetic situation then two compounds really cross this uh, uh, line and those are gallium nitride and another one is astonishingly zinc oxide. Though both these compounds are known to be ferromagnetic or it is calculated uh, to, uh, to show that they possess a definite magnetic moment beyond room temperature. So, therefore, the target molecules or the target compounds which, uh, which have been studied um, in the recent past are the substituted gallium nitride um, materials and also zinc oxide. There are other ones uh, based on zinc um, compounds which are the zinc uh, chalcogenides namely telluride and selenide they also show um, magnetic property, but nevertheless the ones which are around the room temperature carries our attention. Therefore, I will try to show in the next few slides the some of the research that has gone into several of these oxides or non oxide based compounds and we will try to understand how we can clearly escape from the situation where we realize a impurity induced um, ferromagnetic compound and uh, we will also try to see what are all the characterization uh, facilities that are available for us to go into microscopic details to find out whether they are truly magnetic signatures or they are impurity induced ones. Uh, to start with uh, let me show an example of uh, <coughs> Zhu and co-workers who reported 
um, this compound nickel doped titania and uh, this was reported in APL in 2006. You can see here um, they have formed uh, using ion, uh, ion beam implantation technique uh, they have tried to dope nickel in titanium matrix and this is the TEM picture which clearly shows that this is a amorphous and titania uh, matrix because you can see there is no uh, order there and in this there are submerged titanium uh, nickel uh, clusters or nickel particles and uh, these are of the order of say 6 nanometer or so uh, roughly they are of uh, 6 nanometer uh, nickel particles which are actually embedded in titanium matrix. In such case what will happen you will see the magnetic signature very clearly you see a signature at 300 k and this should have actually blown up, but what you see here even at 10 k you do not see a very clear change in the hysteresis, um, but a very feeble hysteresis is developing at low temperature. This was the first report uh, on nickel doped TiO2 and in this case you can see that nickel seems to be in the nickel 0 state as a nickel metallic cluster. It is not uh, a nickel substituted in TAO. There was another uh, uh, example that was reported by Matsumoto in 2001 and what did they do? They have doped cobalt in TAO2 because TAO2 is also a band gap material, white gap band gap material and if you clearly look at the XRD pattern of 8 percent cobalt doped in TaO2, you can clearly see the peaks of anatase TaO2 only with no impurity peaks. So, if you look at the cobalt signature, you would see that it is epitaxially growing and there is no signature and there is no signature of cobalt crystallizing out in any other form. So, in that case you can look at the uh, high resolution TM also we do not seemingly see any sort of uh, change in the interface. It is nicely growing on LaAlO3 uh, substrate, but nevertheless we do not have any clear idea where this uh, magnetic signal is coming from. <coughs> if you look at the uh, magnetic uh, signature M versus uh, H uh, plot clearly shows at room temperature for a 7 percent cobalt doped one you clearly see this hysteresis loop uh, coming and if you are going to sweep the M versus T plot for the same 7 percent cobalt doped uh, TaO2 you can clearly see that there is the ferromagnetic uh, transition is beyond the room temperature. So, just for 7 percent cobalt doped in TaO2 you see uh, the Tc is above room temperature and there is no signal of any cobalt crystallizing out. <coughs> if you look at this uh, cobalt doped zinc oxide for a change you would see um, the XPS that is X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy results which was reported. Uh, in a series of sample. If you look at the cobalt 2 p 3 by 2 and cobalt 2 p half you see a um, XPS feature which is um, with very fine features you would be tempted to say is that cobalt is nicely doped in zinc oxide, but if you carefully look at the uh, signature you would find for a 4.8 nanometer sputtered film. If you deconvolute these features and if you deconvolute these features you would find that cobalt 2 plus is definitely there which means it is clearly substituted in ZnO this is zinc oxide and you would also see the cobalt 2 plus satellite features here. These, these are the satellite features. Now, along with that you also see a clear feature coming for CO uh, which is metallic. In other words, 
you have apart from cobalt getting doped in the ZNO, you also have a proportion of cobalt which is staying as a metallic cluster. So, in this case what you would uh, clearly understand is the magnetic signature although it can come from substituted cobalt which can be doped in the uh, valence band uh, region of your zinc oxide lattice. There is a clear possibility of metallic cobalt contributing to the magnetic property. So, this is very important and we need to uh, be extremely careful that the magnetic signatures what we observe is actually coming from the, uh, the doped situation and not from the metallic clusters. If you take for uh, example, another high band gap material like HFO2 which is doped with the nickel and this can be achieved by pulse laser deposition technique. You would see that the magnetic moment for the YSZ that is the uh, substrate, substrate is almost showing a very very weak uh, magnetic moment of the order of 10 power minus 5 EMU and if you dope uh, if you take the raw um, data of the nickel doped one you see there is a remarkable jump in the uh, feature and if you try to uh, subtract the background then you can see the film is actually contributing something like this. Now, between the uh, substrate and the nickel doped sample the difference is only in this value nevertheless it is a very small feature and therefore, you need to look at the M versus H feature you can see that in the parallel and perpendicular geometry there is a change. If the if in parallel and perpendicular there is a change then we can say that nickel is doped inside uh, HFO2 therefore, you can say that the ferromagnetism is uh, originating from the doped matrix rather than from any type of uh, clusters. This was reported by um, Hong co-workers in 2005 in APL. <coughs> Cobalt doped uh, HFO2 this also can be prepared from pulse laser deposition. You can clearly see that this is clearly a doped situation because if you look at the uh, x-ray of the thin film which is deposited in YSZ. These are the YSZ um, x-ray uh, features and along with that comes the um, reflection for HFO2. This peak is for HFO2 and this peak is also for HFO2 which is 002 and 004 features they nicely grow on YSZ film. Now, if you look carefully at this deviation if you look carefully at this uh, at this peak now you would find out that between the doped and the undoped this is the cobalt doped and this is the undoped there is a clear deviation in the x-ray pattern showing that when you dope to cobalt then there is a shift which means cobalt is substituted in um, HFO2 matrix as a result whatever magnetic feature that is coming whether it is 3 percent or 4 percent or 5 percent you see a systematic increase in the moment of this cobalt doped HFO2 compound. So, one can say that there is a possibility of doping this material in uh, HFO2, but we need to also understand where this uh, magnetic signatures are coming it is proved that the ferromagnetism is attributed to formation of a cobalt rich surface layer because if you do the yields as a function of uh, the thickness of your HFO2. So, you have your YSZ here YSZ substrate and if you have your HFO2 thin film and if you keep on doing the yields uh, study across this thickness as you go towards the uh, surface of this layer as you go to this surface you see the cobalt uh, magnitude or the amount of cobalt 
is actually increasing. The intensity of the cobalt peak is increasing as you go towards the surface of the HFO2 peak. Therefore, it was uh, concluded that it is not purely a dilute magnetic semiconductor rather it is coming from a rich cobalt surface layer which is contributing towards the magnetic property. <coughs> if you take another example this is uh, another uh, classic example of a wide band gap material MgO which is having a band gap above 4 electron volt and in this case if you are going to dope nickel then you can see that there is a paramagnetic sing signal which is superimposed on the ferromagnetic signal mainly because th this is seen at uh, uh, 300 K and this is seen at uh, low temperature. Substitution as well as presence of nickel clusters lead to ferromagnetism at room temperature. So, the uh, at the uh, macroscopic level if you look at the magnetic feature it looks as though you have a very strong ferromagnetic uh, um, signature, but if you clearly probe it these are uh, especially at low temperatures you could see that uh, there is a fer fer paramagnetic signature which is coupled with a ferromagnetic signature and this was reported by Ramachandran in 2007. And uh, if that is the case then if you make a plot of magnetization versus, versus temperature you would see if there is a sudden upsurge in the magnetic movement at low temperatures then th the indication is this is due to substitution and the paramagnetic behavior in the case of substitution comes at low temperature. <coughs> so, uh, with all these confusions around we do not know whether the magnetic signature in this sort of wide range of uh, semiconductors that have been studied whether the uh, whether the magnetic uh, information that we are getting is truly coming from a doped semiconductor or it is coming from a impurity induced magnetic property. If it is impurity induced then it is of no use for the spintronic property. Therefore, we need to be extra careful to know whether the magnetic information is a true phenomena or it is a impurity induced phenomena because in the past it has been observed when you are doing magnetic uh, study even if you are going to pick up these materials with a nickel spatula or a iron spatula or iron forceps even those small impurities can induce quite lot of uh, signature especially because the sort of uh, magnetic uh, signal that you are uh, seeing in a thin film situation is of the order of 10 power minus 5 EMU you have to be very very careful where this uh, signatures are coming from. So, to elucidate this it is possible for us to study a different sort of uh, compounds to say uh, what could happen if there if it is a, a transition metal cluster induced ferromagnetism and what would be the signature if it is truly a ferromagnetic situation. So, for this reason we can actually try to induce magnetism in white band gap oxides by doping transition metals. We can try to do that by doping nickel cobalt iron in ceramic oxides like uh, zirconia, ceria and alumina. I may not be able to run through all these examples, but I will certainly try in, uh, in the next few slides to show you what will happen if you have nickel, cobalt and iron doped in zirconia and try to understand what is the uh, magnetic signature that we can look for if you try to dope it in a wide band gap uh, uh, material. In fact, zirconia is not just a semiconductor we can classify this even as insulator because the band gap is more than 5 uh, E V and uh, we can try to see if we can achieve room temperature ferromagnetism in this high K dielectric uh, ceramic oxides and uh, we can see whether this can be used for potential applications in uh, spintronic uh, technology. <coughs> now, why we are choosing uh, nickel, cobalt and uh, iron based uh, uh, ZRO2 because they form a very important class of compounds called cermets. A cermet is nothing but a ceramic 
and a metal composite ceramic metal composite which is known for more than three decades now and these are used for mechanical applications because zirconia when it is doped with any transition metal it improves the mechanical strength by orders. Therefore, intentionally people dope this uh, <coughs> transition metals including molybdenum <coughs> people have used it and this comes under a special category called cermets. So, cermets are nothing but ceramic metal composites and the optimal properties that you can achieve is one is it is a ceramic. So, you have high temperature resistance and one is you have a metal you have the ability to go through plastic deformation. So, plugged in you have two in one where a, a metal is actually interspersed in a ceramic metal which will add strength to the, uh, to the material. Okay, but we are going to use such a cermet composition to study the magnetic information in, uh, <coughs> in this axis. The metallic elements used uh, as I told you are nickel, molybdenum and cobalt. Cermets can also be um, made uh, with, a com with a concentration of 20 percent uh, metal by volume and cermets are used in the manufacture of resistors, capacitors and other electronic components which may experience high temperatures. So, these are the fundamental um, uh, use of the cermets, but what we are going to do is use this uh, cermet uh, class uh, compounds to see whether we can understand little bit on the magnetic signature. So, how do we do this because zirconia is a material which is uh, a high temperature material therefore, you need very high temperatures to uh, prepare this compounds. We are going to show how using wet chemical roots one can prepare this oxides and there is no need even to make thin films using uh, costly methods like PLD or MB and uh, uh, the, these materials can be prepared at uh, uh, a very uh, faster rate and we can achieve even high temperature phases by non-conventional routes. Uh, I will show one or two examples of how using microwave combustion route we can prepare these compounds. Yeah, microwave assisted combustion route can uh, form a very uh, useful route to prepare this sort of high temperature oxides and uh, in the module 1 in uh, on wet chemical uh, routes I have already discussed with you the use of microwave combustion. Uh, the main um, uh, advantage of microwave combustion is you try to generate uh, high temperatures from within the sample instead of supplying heat to the sample. So, this is the uh, conventional electro heating method whereas, this is the microwave heating method. And <coughs> Uh, the reason why we can use microwave is you are actually starting with some uh, material which is made of nitrate and uh, fuel which is urea and these are uh, materials which have very high dielectric constant therefore, they absorb the microwave uh, much more easily due to a mechanism called dipolar polarization. As a result you can initiate uh, combustion reactions within the sample which can easily lead to a one step decomposition straight to metal oxide. So, therefore, if you have to prepare zirconia at even 1200 degree C, you can achieve that in a using a just a microwave. In other words, a furnace, furnace less uh, technique can be used to initiate high temperature reactions where you can make uh, metal oxide. So, uh, let us say that metal oxides are made out of this uh, reaction then we need to look at the purity and then we need to look at the magnetic signature that we are going to uh, see in this compound. So, uh, we will first start with nickel doped uh, zirconia powders and try to see if we use combustion synthesis to prepare what are the magnetic signatures in this. And uh, this is just the retail analysis for uh, 1 percent and 4 percent doped compounds. You can see clearly that uh, the x-ray pattern xrd pattern that we see for 4 percent nickel doped and 1 percent nickel doped samples clearly show that the um, x-ray pattern resembles that of cubic zirconia. 
if it is going to be monoclinic which is another phase which is reported to be stable at room temperature then you would see signature of the uh, monoclinic phases coming somewhere here. But one would clearly see that there are no features of monoclinic uh, peaks present in the samples clearly showing that just using a simple technique one can um, prepare cubic zirconia. <coughs> now we do not have to just limit with 1 percent and uh, 4 percent which is of interest for our uh, DMS uh, study. One can even go to 10 percent or 20 and we can go even up to 60 percent and try to see in the cermet compositions where exactly nickel oxide impurity peak is coming. As you see here 10 percent peak we do not we still see zirconia in cubic phase and if you go to 20 percent 30 40 you do not see any trace of monoclinic phase coming here. So, this is still in cubic, but what you would see here uh, above 40 percent small peaks are coming these are the nickel oxide peaks. So, these nickel oxide peaks are have started coming beyond 40 percent therefore, if we need to look at the magnetic uh, phases one can say that safely up to 30 40 percent we can keep looking at this magnetic signatures carefully and try to understand whether they are impurity induced or they are coming from substituted ferromagnetism. You can see in the first uh, um, view graph of this magnetic signature for a 1 percent nickel doped zirconia very clearly there is a um, hysteresis loop emerging at 300 k and at 4.2 k. Now, to make sure that this is not coming from zirconia itself because zirconia is actually a uh, oxygen scavenger. Okay. In other words it can easily form Z r 2 minus delta or plus delta because zirconia takes carries a electron and it can give electron and as a result it is also known as fast ion conductor fast ion conductor. But what is important here is any amount of excess oxygen is present it can easily go into the Z R O 2 lattice. So, if uh, we, we should make sure that the magnetic signature is not exactly coming from oxygen stoichiometry. So, if you look at the parent compound parent compound clearly shows a negative trend in the m versus h uh, curve showing that it is non magnetic. So, any signature that is coming is actually coming from nickel doping only. So, for 1 percent nickel doping you can clearly see it is showing a room temperature ferromagnetism and uh, if it is a room temperature ferromagnetic system then one would typically see uh, that the a coercivity value is increasing and the moment is increasing if we measure it at 4.2 k. But what we see here is more of a paramagnetic signature which is coming uh, like this for 4.2 k indicating there is a paramagnetic uh, component associated with the ferromagnetic impurity at 1, one uh, uh, at 1 percent nickel doping and uh, you can see this is clearly blown uh, to show how the coercivity is varying with the temperature. So, definitely there is some possibility of inducing ferromagnetism at this stage. Now, if you go to 4 point uh, for, uh, for 4 percent nickel doping you can see that it is not showing any more of the paramagnetic signature at 4.2 k and there is a definite uh, change in the hysteresis and hysteresis loop clearly shows that there is a strong ferromagnetism that is induced into this uh, zirconia matrix and uh, just to make sure that we are still playing uh, in the safe domain you see that the Z R O 2 which is undoped is showing a negative uh, magnetization slope therefore, whatever is seen here is actually coming from nickel doping. So, you can actually run through uh, from 1 percent you can go up to 60 percent of nickel and try to see what is happening. You can see that the M S value is actually increasing up to uh, 50 percent and beyond 50 percent suddenly you see the magnetization is 
decreasing. Why it is happening? We ha I have already shown that beyond 40 percent nickel oxide starts precipitating out and uh, we can try uh, we, we can based on the magnetic signature then you can try to uh, look at the uh, Bohr magneton in terms of formula unit in terms of nickel atom you can see that there is a progressive uh, increase in this uh, case and then uh, it falls back and then again it increases therefore, there are uh, some safe domains where we can uh, we can look for magnetism that is truly coming from nickel doping and there are some domains where it is coming from uh, the segregated phases. We can see that um, from this sum up of uh, results 1 and 4 percent clearly shows a ferromagnetic group at uh, room temperature this we have seen and if you increase the nickel concentration you can clearly see that the magnetization is systematically increasing, but for 60 percent suddenly it is dropping down. So, that means nickel keeps on going, but if you make a plot of magnetization as a function of nickel concentration you would see that there is a region where the slope is only marginal or we can say it is linear here may be even up to this place and then suddenly the linearity goes this way and then it drops down. So, we can actually say that there are three regions in nickel doping as a function of uh, magnetization a region from say 0 to maybe 10 percent is one region and beyond 10 percent you see a increase in the magnetization and then it again falls down. So, we can sort of propose a tentative magnetic phase diagram saying that if at all we are looking for a dilute magnetic semiconductor then this is the region which we can look for where it is safely nickel which is clearly substituted into the ZRO2 uh, uh, matrix and beyond that in this is a Cermet region where nickel is actually precipitating out as nickel um, clusters and those clusters are embedded in Z ZRO2 matrix as a result you clearly see with more and more of nickel nickel coming out as nickel metallic nickel there is a increase in the magnetization. So, uh, if you look at this magnetic phase diagram we can clearly say that if we are talking anywhere about a possibility of uh, a dilute magnetic semiconductor situation then we should only be talking about 0 to less than 10 percent uh, uh, phase where you can clearly substitute nickel in ZR uh, O2 matrix. <coughs> we can clearly see that from the TEM pictures also this is for 1 percent uh, um, nickel 1 percent nickel what you would see here is a polycrystalline feature, but you do not see any sort of nickel or nickel oxide phase coming in 1 percent, but in 4 percent nickel you see a small feature of nickel oxide which is precipitating out. This is clearly evident from the TEM results. So, we can say that even between 1 to 4 percent there is a safe compositional limit where we have to restrict for a dilute magnetic semiconductor and if you go further your TEM clearly shows that for 50 and 60 percent there is a clear signature of nickel oxide that is coming out and these particles for example, if you map it these are supposed to be nickel oxide which is actually showing this sort of nickel, uh, nickel oxide features in the electron diffraction pattern. So, um, you, you have a increase in the magnetic uh, uh, moment, but the magnetic moment is essentially coming from nickel metal rather than nickel substitution and this we can see from the ferromagnetic resonance as well you can clearly see for 1 and 4 percent there is a systematic change in the uh, magnetic resonance therefore, there is a clear possibility of a DMS that is in picture and uh, how do we know in a macroscopic way we can even look at the powders the morphology of the powders the moment you doped nickel you can see zirconia particles totally the morphology transforms in a very different way when you dope even 1 or 4 percent of nickel and then these are the XPS studies, XPS studies for 1 percent nickel 
clearly shows there is no satellite feature which means there is only one oxygen species there. Suppose there is ZRO2 and then nickel oxide then both will actually show two different oxygen peaks. So, we can clearly say that there is only one phase and therefore, there is no asymmetry in the oxygen uh, uh, one is oxygen peak and here again if you see the nickel uh, uh, 2 p 3 by 2 and nickel 2 p 3 uh, uh, 3 by 2 peaks for 1 and 4 percent of nickel there is no um, satellite features uh, in the nickel 2 p therefore, we can clearly say that nickel is there only in one oxidation state which means nickel is in nickel 2 plus only. Uh, same is true if we take uh, cobalt um, case cobalt is another ferromagnetic ion which can be doped as you can clearly see whether it is 1 percent, 2 percent or 4 percent it is absolutely a clean ZRO2 cubic phase and you do not see any sort of uh, uh, impurity that is induced here and uh, you can also see the magnetic moment is increasing as a function of cobalt therefore, there is a clear possibility of a DMS phase that is emerging out against a um, undoped situation. Therefore, uh, even the uh, cobalt seems to throw a possibility for a, a clear uh, dilute magnetic semiconductor uh, situation and as, as I told you earlier the uh, cobalt substitution can be pronounced in the morphology compared to uh, ZRO2 you can see that cobalt is literally changing the morphology and if you keep substituting cobalt to higher percentage even up to 60 percent unlike the nickel case you can see here that you have a clean zirconia phase that is coming, but beyond 40 percent you can see that cobalt oxide phase that is COO is coming and it is becoming more prominent and when you substitute for 60 percent the, um, the system instead of increasing in crystallinity you can see as you keep doping cobalt the crystallinity dampens and then you almost get a amorphous phase. <coughs> so, cobalt seems to be getting substituted in the zirconia lattice and uh, there is no signature of CO34 which is a magnetic phase which is present anywhere in the x-ray. Therefore, we can say that the magnetic signature if at all anything is there it is not coming from any of the oxide impurity of cobalt it is actually coming from a doped situation. And this is the si uh, similar thing you know you can also try to sinter the same powders at a higher temperature to see whether x-ray is altering you do not see systematically any change with the sintering conditions and uh, you can also see that uh, the uh, lattice parameters by and large remains th uh, the same. Uh, whether it is a as prepared sample or sintered sample saying that the oxidation state of cobalt does not seem to vary with uh, uh, with uh, with annealing. Uh, in other words it says that cobalt is not just embedded in the matrix, but it is actually substituted. And you can also uh, see from these two cartoons whether it is uh, as prepared samples or whether it is sintered at uh, 400 degree C you can see the clear uh, trend in the magnetic property initially it is uh, low and then it picks up just like the way we saw in nickel there is a increase uh, up to 40 50 percent and then there is a drop drop is actually coming from uh, this drop in a moment is coming from impurities of uh, cobalt oxide. So, what we can see from uh, this uh, cobalt substituted compounds uh, beyond uh, 10 percent you can see that the ferromagnetic uh, uh, signature shows that if you sweep magnetization as a function of temperature they all show a steady um, <coughs> temperature independent uh, variation showing that the TC is above 300 K in all these compositions. So, these uh, signatures may come from cobalt metallic clusters clusters whereas DMS phase is possible less in less than 5 percent cobalt doping. Okay. So, 
Uh, we can see this trend even as we sweep through this. Uh, I have already shown you the phase diagram uh, and if you can see the TM features uh, even up to uh, 1, per, 1 10 percent uh, sorry uh, even up to 10 percent of cobalt doping you would see there is no signature of cobalt oxide coming it is a clean ZRO2 phase which means cobalt is substituted and once you go beyond that you can see the cobalt phase is coming. Okay. So, um, I will quickly go through uh, the last uh, example to show uh, what exactly we can conclude out of doping magnetic property in this uh, uh, ZRO2 matrix. Let us take the uh, example of iron. Now, if you dope iron carefully only in low uh, concentration limits say up to 9 percent 3, 6 and 9 percent you can clearly see it is again showing clean say uh, ZRO2 cubic phase. Now, once you look at the magnetic property you see that the magne magnetization is steadily increasing, but the clue whether it is really coming from doped situation or from any other impurity comes from MOS bar. You can see for example, here in this case it is actually 3 percent, this is 6 percent and this is 9 percent, this is at uh, uh, 77 Kelvin and this is at room temperature. One would clearly see that for 3 percent you, you only see the doublet here, you only see the doublet in this case whereas, when you go to 6 percent you can see that this doublet is getting split into a sextet and more so in 9 percent and similar feature is seen even in the 77 Kelvin recorded mass per peak. What we, what we can say is if there is a doublet then ion is actually isolated there is no ion ion interaction in this case whereas, in the case of 6 and 9 percent we seemingly find Fe 304 impurities which are creeping up that is why for 6 and 9 percent you can see a sextet feature is coming for the ion. So, safely we can say what is the compositional limit that we can look for again you see for 3 percent or 6 percent and 9 percent the radically the um, morphology is ch changing. So, what do we see for for nickel cobalt and iron we can say that less than 3 percent of this uh, transition metals doped in zirconia there is a clear possibility of a dilute magnetic signature that is coming. Beyond that even though there is a steady uh, or there is a schematic uh, trend uh, present in the magnetic behavior one has to be careful that this is not actually the true signature that comes from a dilute magnetic phase rather it comes from a impurity induced phase. So, uh, we can sort of say from this uh, study that there is a possibility for um, a dilute magnetic semiconductor not only in ZNO type of compounds even in high band gap materials but we need to be very cautious about uh, finding what is the limiting concentration at which this magnetic phase can be found out. So, with this I conclude and we can look into this uh, aspect later. So, make some quick analysis. Uh, the analysis of magnetization data suggests that ion induces room temperature ferromagnetism high temperature phase. Mass bar study of 3 percent shows doublet and the corresponding 6 and 9 percent show superimposed sextet and doublets. The isomer shift and quadrupole moment indicate ion to be in the 3 oxidation state to occupy different octahedral sites associated with some amount of disorder. So, um, in cases where we do not have a clue here is one classical example that we can use mass bar study to elucidate what is the limiting compensation at which we can realize dilute magnetic phase. I stop here and we will continue in the next lecture.